I love that statement. It pertains to all of us, after all, because the mind is informed by the spirit of play, and every discipline is peppered with vivid terminology. Fractal geometry has dragon curves and packed Swiss cheese cosmologies. There are ladies' slippers in botany and onomatopoeic bushwhackers. Football has wing backs, button hooks, and coffin corners. There are dog legs on golf courses and butterfly valves in automobiles. And when there are no words for what we need, we make up new ones. Drama queen, soul patch, bucket list, Google. <laughs> Remember the children's rhyme that began if all the world were paper and all the sea was ink, if all the trees were bread and cheese, what should we have to drink? Well, that is the danger that in the freedom you are just graduating to. Because if you allow your picture of the world to shrink to the parameters of your job or your field of study, if, overwhelmed by the sheer weight of information available and overcome by the onslaught of falsehoods that masquerade as truths, you begin to sort and file rather than access and ponder, you just might end up experiencing the world as ink and paper riddled with faulty equations and find that your spirit is dying of thirst. In ancient Rome, every citizen owned a genius. The genius was one's personal spirit, which came to each and every one at birth. It represented the fullness of one's potential powers. This genius then was considered a birthright, but it needed to be nourished in order to survive. Today, in our age of the narcissist, the birthday child expects gifts to shower down upon her. But the ancient Roman was expected to make a sacrifice to his or her genius. And if one served one's genius well during one's lifetime, the genius became a household god called a Lars after one's death. If, however, one neglected one's potential, the genius became a spook, a troublesome spirit who plagued the living. Here at Smith College, you have received a top-notch liberal education. That is, you have not only been well-trained in your individual fields, but also been exposed to a range of other disciplines, encouraged to explore new ideas based on a solid core of knowledge geared to help you cope with the boundless changes that you will need to confront in our rapidly vacillating civilization. I wish I could say accelerating civilization, but I'm no longer sure that forward is the direction in which our society is going at the moment. But whether you end up as a politician or a painter, a novelist or a neurologist, this you all have in common. You have learned how to pursue thoughts and ideas, and hopefully you have grown to love that pursuit. Another of my favorite mother goose rhymes goes like this. This is the key to the kingdom. In that kingdom is a city, in that city is a town. In that town there is a street. In that street there winds a lane. In that lane there is a house. In that house there waits a room. In that room there is a bed. On that bed there is a basket, a basket of flowers. Flowers in the basket, basket on the bed, bed in the chamber, chamber in the house, house in the weedy yard, Yard in the winding lane, lane in the broad street, street in the high town, town in the city, city in the kingdom. This is the key to the kingdom. I love this verse because it reminds me
that all ideas, large and grand, have sprung their roots from the very smallest of seeds. In a way, it is a description of the path to wisdom. Start with the things you know. And then as you venture into the world, taking the road of education into ever broader avenues of possibility, apply what you've learned along the way, never forgetting that the key to the kingdom of knowledge is linked to curiosity and appreciation. With these commencement exercises, you are making your departure a public act. You have been in incubation, but now you breathe on your own, no rarefied ether, but the thick air of life. You must generate your own heat. The mission is a mystery. The door leads out and away, as the word commencement implies. It is a door into a new beginning. And as weird as it may sound, one of the things you might most likely miss is that there are no more class assignments to fulfill. Oh yes, because an assignment can force you to go where you would have been too lazy or apprehensive to venture before. And even rote exercises follow this mantra. Athletes know that if they don't keep training, muscles will stiffen and eventually atrophy. Singers speak of supporting the voice, which they do through frequent and sustained practice, strengthening the muscles of the diaphragm so that that clear and beautiful sound you're hearing is being uplifted by years of exercise. So I have one last assignment for you, a bit of homework, the bonus question on the exam you've already passed with flying colors. I challenge you to tweet your very own graduation poem, your feelings, your fears and hopes, and well, whatever details you intend to carry with you on the way into the future. Tweet your poem using hashtag grad poem. In return, I'll leave you with one of my own poems called Dawn Revisited. Dawn Revisited. Imagine you wake up with a second chance. The blue jay hawks his pretty wares and the oak still stands spreading glorious shade. If you don't look back, the future never happens. How good to rise in sunlight, in the prodigal smell of biscuits, eggs and sausage on the grill. The whole sky is yours to write on, blown open to a blank page. Come on, shake a leg. You'll never know who's down there frying those eggs if you don't get up and see. So don't forget, tweet your poem using hashtag grad poem and after you pick up this little degree, go on out and celebrate. Congratulations, class of 2018. Thank you.